can whistle a happy tune, so no one will suspect I'm afraid. While shivering in my shoes, I strike a careless pose and whistle a happy tune, so no one ever knows I'm afraid. The result of this deception is very strange to tell. For when I fool the people I fear, I fool myself as well. I whistle a happy tune, and every single time, the happiness in the tune convinces me that I'm not afraid. Make believe you're brave, and the trick will take you far. You may be as brave as make believe you are. You may be as brave as you make believe you are.
Jimmy Whitrock, ladies and gentlemen. Jimmy Whitrock and George Conrad. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is the sixth and final day of the 30th annual North Idaho College Popcorn Forum and Convocation Series. We're delighted to see you back again today. You have been very, very committed to the whole week, and we're grateful. Before I introduce the host for today, I would like to ask if Justin Van Eaton would please come forward. Justin? He's shy. I guess he left. <laughs> what I want to do, and, and I know his staff is up in the booth. Uh, here he is. Justin, come here a moment, please. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Justin Van Eaton and his staff, and they've been working with us for six days. They've been doing it year after year, and it goes off on time. And they spend hours and hours here, uh, even early morning. And they're also getting ready for the concert on Saturday night. Give Justin and his staff a great big thank you. And it's my pleasure to introduce to you a very good friend of mine. She is the media past vice president of the Associated Students of North Idaho College. She's been highly committed to our work, and she's going to be your host today, Tara Lenz. Hello. How is everyone doing today? Before we get started with the speeches this afternoon, let me remind you that there will be a response panel at 1 o'clock and 7 o'clock in the Lake Coeur d'Alene room of the Student Union Building. Both panels will contain former presidents, first ladies, and influential political figures in America throughout the 20th century. And at 12 o'clock, we have our keynote address by Raymond Reyes on the contribution of Native Americans in 20th century America. It is now my great honor to introduce to you a former president of the United States. This president served as the governor of New York until he was elected president in 1933. He is the only person to be elected to the office of presidency for four terms. This president created the New Deal to combat the, excuse me, the Great Depression that Americans faced, and he led America to victory in World War II before his death. Please put your hands together to welcome one of our great American presidents, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. That's grand, that's grand. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very good to be here today. However, I was wondering, you undergraduates and possibly some of you graduates who see me today for the first time, have perhaps heard through the great minds of history that I was, at the very least, an ogre. A consorter with communists, a destroyer of the rich, a breaker of our ancient traditions. Some of you may think of me, perhaps, as the original inventor of the economic ignoramus, of the wicked utility of the money changers in the temple. That I was driving the nation into bankruptcy, and that I breakfasted every morning on a dish of grilled millionaires. Actually, I... Now that we have these simple misunderstandings corrected, I believe I have a small speech to give about the importance of my early policies and objectives. But before I do that, I must take some time to reminisce about my experiences in this great city, uh, Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, it's a place of special significance for me and serves as a spot of recollection. I have been to Idaho 
On a few occasions, I am stopped in this city on one of my tours of the Northwest, coming from the Great Plains, on road to Seattle. Idaho is, of course, home to the sacred soil of this nation's potato fields. Not necessarily right here. I guess I've also addressed Lumberjacks, uh, the Great Coulee, uh, the Bonneville Dams in Oregon, also a very good reason to come through Coeur d'Alene, of course, but specifically the potato I love. Every great civilization produces a great plant for society to enjoy, and I believe Idaho produces something like 30% of this great nation's fall production, which is really incredible. However, we should remember that in the 19th century, I think it was 8 million people died in Ireland due to their reliance on this great plant. So I say to you today, Idaho, lift up your hearts and bless that spot. For it is difficult to do. Yes, indeed, it is good to be in Coeur d'Alene. I remember when I first thought of running for president, I thought of returning to a place like this, which is very similar to my home, uh, where I grew up in Hyde Park, New York, about 75 miles from the north of New York City. Very similar to this place with books and trees, and a bit of traveling is, from the personal point of view, a good deal more alluring than the possibility of holding down the most difficult and thoroughly annoying job in the world. Still, like all of us in my family, if I get projected in a fight, you'll be damn sure I'll try to win it. However, before the years of politics, I spent a great deal of time in a university setting. Uh, I attended school at Harvard University. Some of my fondest memories, influential contacts were resolved in those years. Of course, at the time, I still had the full use of my legs. I had not yet been struck with the polio disease yet. It is no matter. In fact, it probably would have been a blessing kept me from making a complete fool of myself as I tried out for football teams and whatnot very unsuccessfully. Actually, I should not joke about polio. It is a very traumatic, very serious, very life-altering illness. In fact, I created the Warm Springs Foundation to combat this very epidemic. You see, after my unsuccessful bid for the vice presidency in 1920, I was looking to spend some remainder of my summer in Camp Bellow, Maine, <coughs> with my family, and I left New York on August 5th, and by August 12th, I could not move my legs at all. I was paralyzed from the chest down. I could not even hold a pen, as a matter of fact. Eleanor pleaded with our family doctor to stop in Camp Bell to see me. He did, and I was diagnosed, actually, with the common cold. However, the extreme pain, the loss of movement of my legs, motivated me to seek another diagnosis. I was then said to have a bladder congestion, that had settled in my lower spinal cord, and the simple prescription was heavy massage, and that was that. A uh, full week passed by, and eventually my uncle, Fred, sent off to Boston to talk to doctors at the Harvard Institute for Infantile Paralysis, and after hearing the symptoms, paralysis, oh, very good. Wonderful technology. Thank you very much. May I say, my haircut is in order. <laughs> yes, I had polio, which is an inflammation of the spinal column. The virus lodged in the anterior cells of my spinal cord, which controlled my lower extremities. The cells were destroyed and could not regenerate themselves. I lost and never regained the use of my legs. The illness, however, did not necessarily improve my ability to be aware of the plight of the common man. I had grown in vision and understanding. But other than giving the nominated speech for Al Smith, a fellow, a fellow New Yorker who had been running for president at the Democratic National Conventions both 1924 and 1928, I had for the time being retired from politics. <laughs> however, under incredible pressure from Al in 1928 to run for governor of New York in order to help his campaign, I was thrust back into the political arena. Now, I was 46 years old. I had been in treatment for seven years, and I gave it all up to run in an election in which I was not favored. However, it was good to feel the excitement of another campaign and the satisfaction of once again being needed by my party. In an upset, I won. Yet, with each step in assuming power, a person is forced to broaden his spectrum of interests. Consequently, I now had to see the negative aspects, poor labor, unemployment, poor planning. It was obvious that the American enterprise system was a terrific financial institution 
for democracy and superior to most others. However, it is inherently flawed by heavy risk and unpredictability. It was essential, I thought, that the American public realize these ideas in order to assure a safe and stable American lifestyle. You see, as I was coming up and running for office, after nine years of constant prosperity, the accumulation of wealth seemed like a permanent condition rather than a swing in an economic cycle. America was the spoiled child of history, with the greatest privileged class the world had ever seen. Everybody ought to be rich. That was the slogan. But after the stock market crash of 1929, the value of stocks was down by 50%. The borrowers couldn't pay, the banks couldn't collect, the depositors withdrew their money. Yes, the United, the United States had hit a depression, but President Hoover refused to acknowledge its seriousness, and the financial community followed him. In June of 1930, as a matter of fact, the same gentleman told me this, a delegation of uh, this gentleman and a number of others went to Washington to speak to Mr. Hoover to plead for a public works program. At this time, approximately 25% of the nation was out of work. Those who were working were only making $2,000 a year, and that was full time, and those were the lucky. Gentlemen, he told these gentlemen, when he came to visit him, that is, you have come 60 days too late. The depression is over. But in Kansas, wheat had become 30 cents a bushel. And right here in Idaho, dozens of handbills littered the walls announcing farms for sale. And in Chicago, the public libraries had never been so crowded, having become a refuge for the homeless and the unemployed. In September, England went off the gold standard, which was like doomsday for the financial community. It was unthinkable. Every foreign investor who owned American securities sold them and took the gold home. The flight of gold continued until $5 billion had left the country. As deposits shrank, more banks closed. Real estate lost value. Equity and mortgages disappeared. The New Empire State Building in my state of New York could not rent office space and could not even afford to operate the elevator. Builders could not get loans, and the construction business entirely died. There was something terribly wrong with society, my friends. What was wrong when the richest land on earth had gone broke? How could people go hungry in a nation that could produce so much wheat? Where were our great slogans? Where were work and thrift and sound principles and the American way of life and go west, young man, the land of opportunity? Where was the slogan, everybody ought to be rich? They had been replaced by tight in your belt, bread lines, grown men working as caddies, soup kitchens, panhandling. The Depression destroyed the myth of self-reliance, my friends, which had been appropriated by the economic royalists in this nation to justify non-interference by our government. An American, they would tell you, was a man who did not need help. Like the pioneers who had made this country habitable, he went his own way and solved his own problems. An American was a man who knew which way to reach tomorrow. An American was a man who never asked anyone anything, who he was or where he came from or what he did, because it was answer enough just to be an American. This, this was splendid rationale for all those who would have you believe this, our economic princes, the excesses of their capitalism, but for the farmer who had lost his farm, and for the worker who had lost his job in the unregulated misery of those depression years, self-reliance was cold comfort. You see, after the stock market crash of 1929, unemployment had reached a level that we had never seen. However, as an elected official, it is one thing to recognize the gravity of the situation and quite another to find remedies for it. Gradually, my Secretary of Labor, Francis Perkins, and I came around to the idea of intervention into these sorts of social problems. We decided it was high time for such things as unemployment insurance and workers' compensation for injury. As I said before, the free enterprise system at this time was making the country more unpredictable and consequently, life was becoming more unpredictable. These programs only gave some stability to the financial situation of Americans and American families. Moreover, they did not cramp democracy like many of my critics would tell you. They simply provided a safety net to catch the casualties of the enterprise system, not to strangle it. And what is the problem with this? 
Critics blared at me at the time that these things had never been done, and so they could not, or they should not be done. Actually, I will tell you, the regulation of business has a strong uh, historical buttress. Uh, Madison, in The Federalist, wrote that the regulation of these money and manufacturing interests should be the principal task of modern legislation. Furthermore, let's ask ourselves today, what is the proper role of government? It is, after all, the duly constituted representation of an organized society of human beings created by them for their mutual protection and well-being. Our government, I will tell you, is but the machinery through which such mutual aid and protection are achieved. If mutual aid required the expansion of government functions, that went hand in hand with the concept of social responsibility. In broad terms, I assert that modern society, no different today than it was in my time, acting through its government, owes the definite obligation to prevent the starvation or the dire want of any of its fellow men and women who try to maintain themselves but cannot. The people at my time were certainly agreeing with me. This time I was still governor of New York and the state was serving as a wonderful laboratory for national relief programs with unemployment insurance, steps for stabilization of industry, the National Guard armories used to house the homeless. The state of New York began to look like the model at which the nation would like to follow, and I, as governor, was getting the credit. Consequently, as letters poured in across the country urging me to seek the Democratic nomination, I felt that if America and my party called for it, I would run for President of the United States. Now, I knew that running a national campaign and being properly prepared in issues and approaches to national concerns was nearly impossible while I still had to fulfill my duties as governor. I thought that if we could get a small group of gentlemen together willing to give some time, they can prepare a memoranda about such things as the relief of agriculture, tariffs, railroads, government debts, private credit, money, all the aspects of national concern. So my good man, Louis Howe, and I picked a group of professors from Columbia University, politely asked them if they would like to finally implement some of those theories they had been bouncing off classroom walls for so many years. Men who were experts in the fields of economics, agriculture, and business. And I was sitting in a room with these gentlemen. We would pick our brains to solve these problems. As a result, they became known as the Brains Trust. And they were an excellent part of my campaign. And it was definitely underway and running like a well-oiled machine. Now, at this point, I had served two years in the State Senate of New York, seven years as the Assistant Secretary of Navy under President Wilson and just a short time as governor of New York. And now in 1932, I found myself deep in the race for president and remarkably, winning was looking quite simple. Hoover never once mentioned the depression in his speech at his own nomination at his party's convention. The noble elephant as his symbol. In his case, more like the ostrich, if you ask me. The people reacted and I won the election of 1932, 472 electoral votes to 59, with 42 states behind me. When I took office early in 1933, America was in the deepest pit of the recession. My cabinet and I met immediately, of course. We worked constantly to devise a correct plan for controlling the banking situation. It seems that with given human greed, it is impossible for banks to correctly regulate themselves at times. Consequently, the Emergency Banking Act was introduced in the House in the first day of session, just to give you an example of the time in which I operated. Committees had not yet been appropriated, nor had the bill even been printed for debate on the floor, yet it was passed that day in both houses and signed that evening. You see, I was starting the New Deal in a time of great despair, usually with any national policy, of course, in a country as diverse as the United States, it comes with inherent controversy. But this time was different. America was suffering and a revolution had begun. Not one of rifles and bayonets, but of starvation and despair. New economic plans and goodwill were passed with what was called machine gun legislation. During my first 100 days, both houses were firmly controlled by the Democrats. That included 150 new impressionable freshmen who had been washed into the house, who had been coming in with the tide of the Great Depression, of course. And my first attempt at unemployment was the formation of the Civilian Conservation Corps. I was working with Francis Perkins, once again, now my National Secretary of Labor. And we devised a plan to use army supplies to shelter and supervise the men while the interior directed the work of the CCC. 
This, of course, gave young, uneducated men the opportunity to become wage earners and to make a start for themselves in life, but it also gave other individuals, like black men, the opportunity to become known as a member of working American society and in a manner that did not offend Southerners, or our good senators from Southern states at least. Politics is never simple or straightforward, and by simply creating dams, controlling floods, and generating cheap power, the formation of the Tennessee Valley Authority was one of the most controversial bills ever passed by my administration. Some critics called the bill the Congressional Folly, or the Soviet Dream. This was ridiculous. If you did not believe that children went hungry during the Great Depression, then you should have gone to a town like Decatur, Alabama, and seen them, undernourished and vacant-eyed. In some areas, 30% of the population had malaria, and nearly every year the farmland was ravaged by flood. Half of the population lived on a farm, and 97% of those farms had no electricity. Upon completion of the dam, hundreds were employed. Malaria disappeared. The cheap power rates would serve as a yardstick for private companies, and the valley forests would be replanted. If this was a Soviet dream, I can assure you, it was not one of Joseph Stalin. Yes, success was booming, and critics were being silenced, and soon all kinds of legislation would be passed. Labor unions would be set up, limits on the number of working hours, and a minimum wage requirement. Then we would tackle the issue, of course, of Social Security. However, at that time, of course, I knew that we could only try to frame a law that will give some measure of protection to the average citizen and his family against the loss of a job and against the poverty-ridden old age. This is right, this is American, and this is what we need for sanity in the advancement of age. However, no matter how obvious it may seem to most Americans, there are still a few who stand in opposition to direct and proper democratic process and would rather cater to their own ideas rather than those of the people. Quite some time ago, as a matter of fact, a very important businessman of New York City came to see me to talk about the one thing that lay nearest to his heart, the balancing of the budget. The budget. Well, I told him it was pretty important and that we were going to get a balance next year. Then I asked him if he had ever read the budget, and he said no. And I asked him how much he would like to see the United States save in the coming year, if we could, and he said, oh, about two or three or eight or 20 or 50 billion dollars. And then came my question, which always stumps people of his kind. I said, oh, very good. So just where would you cut expenses? He hemmed and hawed and hemmed and hawed some more, but he couldn't tell me where he would save money, although he was saying to the nation, through the newspaper he owned, that it was perfectly simple to do it. Well, I pressed him on it, and finally he said this. You can stop building, you can stop building right away these silly public works like Fort Peck or the Grand Coulees or the Bonneville Dam. Stop all this flood control business. Stop all this irrigation business. When I suggested to him that his program would bring terrific hardship to several million Americans, he finally told me what his real philosophy of life was. He said, all this business of helping people is ruining the country. Look at my taxes. I have to pay half of my income in federal, state, and local taxes. Well, I happen to know what this gentleman's income was, which was at the time about $400,000 a year, and that poor man thought he was going to the poor house because after paying taxes, he only had 10 times what everyone else had. In the working of a great national program, which seeks the primary good of the greater number, it is true that the toes of some people are being stepped on and are going to be stepped on. But those toes belong to the comparative few who seek to gain position or riches or both by some shortcut which is harmful to the greater good. And above all, there is an element in the readjustment of our financial system more important than currency and more important than gold and that is the confidence of the people themselves. Confidence and courage are the essentials of success in carrying out our plan. You people, no less today than in my time, must not be stampeded by rumors or guesses. Let us unite today, just as we did when I was still here, in banishing fear. You have provided the machinery for our financial system, and it is up to you to support it and make it work. 
So at this time, as I was pushing, these domestic programs through Congress, other leaders in other lands were bent on expansion. But before that, I had to concern myself with the re-election of 1936, which I won, I believe, 523 electoral votes to eight. This was a clear evaluation of the New Deal, and I would say it was positive. Now, the leisures that accompany these good feelings uh, surrounded our administration, and we finally were able to enjoy ourselves in office. In fact, I pulled once, I suppose this may interest the audience, I, I pulled a hoax once on Mr. Joe Kennedy, who was a good friend of mine at the time. This is, of course, off the record, but Joe, who was, of course, Catholic, and uh, I asked him once, uh, you know, would you go to me with a Shriners, to a Shriners parade, of course, not, not a Catholic organization, and I said, would you come with me, Joe? I'm, I'm all alone. It'd be so terrible. And he said, my God, I go to a Shriners parade? Well, I said, sure. Oh, the Catholics will be coming, and I didn't know, of course, but... I thought I'd have some good fun with Joe, and he said, is that a command, Mr. President? And I said, sure. And so Joe arrived, and it was a terribly rainy night, and didn't last very long, only about a quarter of the parade, and we went back, and Joe had been sliding behind the police all night so the photographer wouldn't get him, and he went back up to Hyannis Port, or wherever the Kennedys are these days. And I waited about two and a half weeks, and at the end of July, I sent him a telegram. I picked any old name out of the telephone book, John Turner, or something like this, and that said, Honorable Joseph P. Kennedy, in accordance with our delightful conversation the night of the Shriners Parade, will it be convenient for you to go through the ceremony and become a great Shriner the first week of September? A large and distinguished gathering will be here to welcome you. Please wire as quickly as possible to Admiral Kerry T. Grayson, a friend of mine. We count on your presence at the ceremony, and we will make it as easy for you as possible. Yours sincerely, John Turner. Well, I sent this off, and Joe had a fit. That night, when he was leaving the parade, one of the two high muckamucks in the shrine gave him a lift in their car, and Joe said, my God, what did I say that night? I swear to you I was perfectly sober. What could I have said? So Joe, of course, had to tell his wife and the children, the whole Kennedy family went up through the roof all of August. He tried to find out about it and called Admiral Grayson as it was directed, and Grayson said, I don't know a thing about it, except that I got a message from you that there'd be a telegram and Joe to become a shriner, and Joe said, are you a Shriner? And Kerry, of course, lied like a trooper and said, of course, of course I'm a Shriner. <laughs> By the 25th of August, I was talking to Joe on the telephone from the White House, and he was still up at the Cape. And at the end of the conversation, I said, by the way, Joe, are you, are you going to be down here the first week of September? And Joe put it together immediately and said, you blankety blank, blank. And just like that, and to the President of the United States. <laughs> yes, Joe did have a bad mouth. After these good times, of course, things had to become more serious. Europe was demanding the attention of the world. And in 1939, the administration had to shift its policy from domestic to foreign. Mussolini invaded Ethiopia, but at the time we weren't too concerned. I always like to say, in fact, the first thing the Italians demanded from the government was 500 women of easy virtue. However, in September, Hitler invaded Poland. Europe was becoming a real hot potato, and two days later, Britain had had enough, and the attack on Poland became a war, a world war, and the display of more grotesque power than mankind had ever seen. It was, at that time, my duty to convince the nation that the th threat to Britain and to France was also a threat to America. Any attempt at ending democracy is an attempt at the American way of life. We weren't involving ourselves in the war. Rather, we were helping our friends without getting our feet wet. We were willing to use any method short of war, however, to bring the message to aggressor governments that the sentiments of our people were not supporting them. Congress and I set up such things you probably are aware of, cash and carried lend lease proposals to supply Britain with food, machinery, weapons, ammunition, finances, and whatnot. Churchill promised me at the time that America could serve as the arsenal of democracy. Give Britain the proper tools and they will finish the job. Isolationists, of course, were still upset with even this light proposal, yet, would you not lend your garden hose to your neighbor whose house was on fire, especially if it would keep the fire from spreading? However, I was still, of course, wholeheartedly against war. During World War I, as Assistant Secretary of the Navy, I had a telephone next to my bed with a direct line to the Naval Department, which would ring in the middle of the night, only to bring me terrible news. The First World War was fresh in Americans' minds, and I had seen war, and the last thing I wanted to do was send another army to Europe. On top of these worries, however, was the upcoming election of 1940, and I had every intention of stepping down and giving my support to others for president. This, of course, was 
the third term that I would seek. Eleanor wanted me home, and history was going to have a very hard time with me running for a third term. I did not want to run. I had been tied down to that presidential chair too long, and I could hardly stand it any longer. I was not going to run between January and the Democratic Convention unless things got very worse, and things did indeed. In May came the true shocker. When the Germans sliced through France, the great nation had fallen like a domino to the blitz. America had to start to worry. Consequently, I agreed to run for a third term against Wendell Wilkie. I won in 1940, I believe it was 449 electoral votes to 82, something like this. The nation was still strongly behind. The administration was still very strongly behind its people, the people behind us, and we were focused in on Europe. On June 22, 1941, Russia was invaded by Germany, thus breaking their non-aggression pact and creating a second front. Most Americans were delighted. They wanted to see Russia badly beaten and Germany totally destroyed. However, you must know that it is very tough to take on Russia on their own soil. According to Russia at the time, the Bolshevik dogma that war is normal and peace is abnormal, Russia had come out with a new model of tanks each year like Ford introduces a new line of cars. Plus, as Napoleon could tell you, moving a military through a Russian winter was very different from walking on the boulevards of France and Belgium. Now, the American people were getting quite upset and I issued a group of American battleships to patrol the Atlantic, and I gave the orders that when you see a rattlesnake poised to strike, you crush it. You do not wait until he has bitten you. From now on, if Germany or Italian war vessels enter the waters, the protection of which is necessary for American defense, they do so at their own peril. Fearing the imminent arrival of the United States at a war with the Axis powers, as you know, Japan devised a strategy to assault us, and despite the fact that they had two ambassadors negotiating peace in the United States up to the very minute of their unwarned invasion on December 7th, 1941, a date that will live in infamy. The United States was attacked by Japan. I could not believe it was true. My beautiful Navy caught off guard and crushed. It is a terrible disappointment to be president in a time of war and the circumstances came most unexpectedly. The United States of America had been attacked. It was nearly inconceivable. But it brought home the fears of war, and immediately war was declared on Japan, and holding true to their Axis contract, Germany declared war on us, which saved me the trouble of contacting Congress and asking for another vote, and suddenly the United States of America had officially entered the Second World War. Of course, as you know, I was then re-elected for my fourth term as president, with President or as president, pardon me, with my vice president, Harry Truman, at my side. I plan to make this term just as successful as all the rest, and most importantly, I hoped to see an end to the war. It was definitely in our grasp, and after the stunning show of American pride and valor, and the storming of the beaches of Normandy, and the great victory against Japan's carriers sunk at the Battle of Midway, we were well on our way to peace. I had also traveled to Yalta to discuss our plans of dividing Germany into a stable democracy and to ask for other leaders' help in creating an international peace organization. After each war, there still lies a seedbed of conflict, and the lesson of history was not to lose the peace after you had won the war. So, finally I say to you today to remember that in Washington's day, the task of the people was to create and weld together a nation. In Lincoln's day, it was the task of the people to preserve democracy from disruption within. In my day, it was the duty of the people to save this nation from disruption from without. In the face of great perils, never before encountered, your strong purpose is to protect and to perpetuate the integrity of democracy. United, you cannot fail. Keep your faith, maintain your peace, may God bless your efforts, and thank you very much, Coeur d'Alene. Thank you very much. Now, I believe we'll take some questions while I still have some time. Would anyone like to know anything at all Very good.
Yes. I've heard that. I've heard that you enjoy hunting. Uh, what is your favorite thing to hunt? I I do enjoy hunting. I was a hayseed of sorts. I I I was raised on a farm in northern New York State, uh, where we had a number of good game to hunt, uh, rabbits and pheasants and whatnot. But hunting in the Roosevelt tradition is probably most associated with my uh, very good and somewhat distant uncle Teddy, who was the true hunter of our family, and in his shadow I pale horribly. Uh, Mr. President, weren't you the first one to uh, enact our national parks? Uh, yes, the national parks program was set up. Of course, as you know, we had a terrible process with our own land. There was uh, great overproduction in some ways. Uh, many marginal pieces of land, uh, the sides of hills and things were being were being taken under. We had a horrible drought. Uh, there was a need for great pieces of our great nation, just like other great nations who have a nature reservoir, a place where man and nature can live together and so the future generations can enjoy the outdoors just as I had done as a boy. I thought there was some threat that overproduction would almost completely eliminate all that our land could offer naturally. And so I see that our great national parks continue to exist and this is truly a very beautiful part of the country. Is there another question? Yes. Um, what is your view on the national debt? Today's national debt? Well, that's very interesting. <laughs> Having a debt is unpopular and it is not positive. However, eradicating, eradicating the debt, that is, does not put people to work. Actually, the accumulation of debt is not that strange. I mean, many of you in the audience, of course, have debts to further progress on something else. It is my belief that if people are in desperate need or desperate want, they should, uh, at least our government, which is responsive to the people, should take some responsibility to take care of them. We are, as Americans, guaranteed liberty. And in my mind, liberty and freedom equate prosperity and happiness. As such, I believe it is the government's role to provide some of that prosperity, some of that happiness, in order for people to get above a certain level. Now, today, however, you have a very, diff di very, very, very different circumstance than me. Uh, your stock market is incredible. Uh, I think you should probably make some attempt at eradicating your debt, but it is not so terrible. Deficits, however, are, would be my concern. Trade deficits. Yes. Mr. President, I understand that the Polish ambassador came to you very early in the war to tell you and warn you about the Holocaust. And um, your reply to him was, they will be punished. But you made no move to publicize it or to let the world at large know about this. Why was that? Yes, we were taking in a number of refugees. At the time, I wanted specifically to allow people with anyone who had a visa who passed into America, anyone who was uh, suffering from some sort of war crime in a way that was much more specific. Uh, their intellectual properties were being damaged, like a Mr. Einstein, or they were a leader. We accepted a number of immigrants, especially Jewish immigrants, uh, but we capped it at a certain level. I did not know exactly of the atrocities. I did not know that for a few years. Now, you're right. At that time, Hitler did, it was obvious, wanted to get rid of the Jews from Germany. I knew this, and I believed he was simply getting them out of the nation. I did not know at that time that he would provide such black crimes in, in our history, such terrible places of death. I thought that he would just simply move them out of Germany, not necessarily into the United States, but into Canada, into Cuba, into Latin America, into Australia. I did not know. Uh, in retrospect, as the war closed, we attempted to get more of these individuals into our nation. However, at that time, as you know, it was very difficult as the internment camps had already 
done their terrible work. So that is something we should consider. Is there another question? Yes. Yes, Mr. President, how would you respond to the rumors that you knew uh, beforehand of the attack of Pearl Harbor? Yes, I have heard this before. No, I knew nothing of the sort. As I said, Japanese, oh, we, of course, we, we of course were picking up coded messages in the Pacific. Uh, some of the uh, Japanese communication, however, their ambassadors were in the United States. They were negotiating a way to avoid war up to that very minute. They did not declare war on us, they simply attacked. This, I thought, was completely ridiculous and far and away beyond any kind of, any kind of social justice whatsoever. I was disgusted with the Japanese. I would never, ever allow my great navy to be destroyed. As Assistant Secretary of the Navy, I knew a number of the gentlemen. I knew the names of the ships. I would never, never allow an attack on our great soil. Mr. President, I want to thank you for appearing here today. And I'd like to ask you what your favorite uh, recreations might be and, and which state you prefer to stay in. Well, <laughs> rock climbing, of course, and skiing. Right here in Idaho, no. My great pastimes generally are on a boat. I love to sail. I love to fish. I have often said that when I go for Mama, on my fishing trips, I learn a great deal from the barracudas and from the sharks, so I can go back to Congress and finally get some work done. Uh, Mr. President, after uh, the uh, Bolshevik Revolution and the Red Scare, after communism was basically stamped out in the United States, how would you explain the complete turnaround during the war when everybody uh, felt, well, differently? Yes. I never supported any communism or socialism or any of the other alien isms, but with the complete fallout of an economic foundation, a nation is susceptible to rapid change change that would be the voice of a dictator, uh, change that could be a fascist, change that could be a communist, even a dictatorial communist. I believe that we should reform our government, essentially to save capitalism from itself, to take the beautiful garden that had been laid by our founding fathers and to strip out the weeds of the excess and to change. Essentially, stability is not immobility. I believe that reform creates that progress. I think that we should have, and we did, do simple reforms to try to save ourselves and save our capitalism. But it is very, very, very easy for the mind to be open to the suggestions of rhetoric, such as fascism or communism. Yes? How many times did you actually meet with Winston Churchill, and what was your relationship like? Oh, the number of times, I can't count. He had stayed at the White House a number of times. Of course, he is a very, very good friend. In fact, he was such a good friend. Many of my very close staffers and family were somewhat jealous of him. Uh, we had met at very important meetings. We signed the Atlantic Charter. We met in Yalta. We met at the Tehran Conference, along with Joseph Stalin and a number of others. Uh, so we've had lots of great meetings. He is an incredible leader. And I would say he was the best man that Britain had at that time of war. Are there any other questions? We have one, one final question, and then Tara's going to introduce you to who you really are. Uh, Mr. President, in 1944, did you have an inkling how ill you were or tired, perhaps, and, and thought, give any thought to not running in 44? Oh, I certainly gave it a great deal of thought to not running. I was not at all convinced of my physical ailment. However, the rest of the nation, it seemed, was. I went on a 56-hour car trip through the rain simply to convince the nation that I was fine. I was very healthy. I knew, however, a doctor had told me that my heart was starting to harden and not in 
an unloving way, but in the very physical way. And I knew that problems may erupt, but I was not at all convinced that I could not continue in my job. Plus, we were still, we were on our way to victory. It was unthinkable for me to then leave the nation, although a fourth term did scare me, and it was starting to scare parts of the nation, but I was not going to step down. Yes, eventually I was in Warm Springs. I had a terrible headache. What eventually I believe I died from was a cerebral hemorrhage, but the stress of the presidency, 12 years, good Lord, lucky I made it that long. We are now going to take just a couple questions um, for Christopher. This is Christopher Carlson. Um, he graduated from University of North Dakota with a um, bachelor's in political science, a minor in religion and philosophy. So let's see, he gave his, um, in 1997, he gave his first person, Franklin D. Roosevelt, in, for the humanities performance at the National Collegiate Honors Conference. You can go ahead and tell a little bit more about yourself. Also, after this, we are going to take a 10-minute break, but I want to remind you that Raymond Reyes will be speaking at noon, and it's going to be a wonderful speech, so remember to come back to join in that. Yeah, well, <laughs> so here I am. I actually have glasses. I can hardly see anyone. So there are some things that should be uh, brought up. Uh, I was surprised, someone was asking me about uh, if I knew of war with Japan. No, it, it is assumed, you know, that we did decode the messages maybe just barely before they attacked, and there's all kinds of rumors that, you know, J. Edgar Hoover maybe knew it and things like this. Uh, but as far as we know, FDR absolutely did not know. He would have never allowed his Navy to be destroyed, and that brings up another interesting question that I thought would come next. Uh, would he have used the atomic bomb, which is also a popular question. And I think that he would have. He, he began the Manhattan Project years before it was ever used. He had a genuine distaste for the Japanese, too, after the attack on Pearl Harbor. He was, uh, for the time, not very active, but for the time, a civil rights leader, but he genuinely disliked the Japanese from all of his personal writings. One of the other problems with FDR, though, is that he never got to be an, a retired president. He died in office. So he never got to write his memoirs and those kinds of things. So you sort of have to guess at what he would do. Are there any questions for me as a human being <laughs> who stands before you? No? Uh, well then, I encourage you to read a book, listen, listen to your teachers, or go back to school. Um, you are all very good. This is an, an extraordinary audience. Thank you very much. God bless us all.